So we're just going to have a brief talk about uh, some general concepts within osteopathic manual therapy and other manual therapeutic modalities uh, with respect to osteopathy, particularly <clears throat> many of the people that have gone through osteopathic training or are osteopathic practitioners will read books from the original osteopathic manual practitioner or osteopathic physician or DO, however you want to term it, and Dr. Still. One of the things that people will speak about is that he didn't necessarily teach technique. He would teach through analogy, he would teach through demonstration, but he didn't necessarily teach technique. Many people will speak about the fact that he taught principles. If you're actually looking at the books that he's written, as far as the actual principles of treatment or how to perform treatment, the most consistent statement that he would make would be utilize the forces of lever, wedge, and screw. Uh, sometimes he would say fulcrum, sometimes he would say wedge. It, it varies, but generally speaking, lever, wedge, and screw. So what we're gonna do is just provide a very general overview of what those things are, provide some demonstrations of how they look in action so that you can then utilize those concepts to formulate treatment options of your own. So a lever uh, is essentially a rigid member uh, that can more or less rotate on a, on a, po on a point on itself. Uh, so more often than not, what we will think of is usually uh, kind of a lever arm or some kind of rod. That's what we will often think of. So within osteopathic manual therapy, when we talk about a lever, many people will conjure up images in their mind of utilizing the arm or the leg as long levers, whether a fully outstretched arm or a fully outstretched leg or a bent arm or a bent leg, what have you, as long levers. We also have short levers, so directly on a structure. So I could be directly on and do on the thumb and doing joint glides, be directly on soft tissue and being do and doing soft tissue motion or applying pressure to soft tissue, whatever it should be, that would be a short lever. We also have mixed leverage, so combination of long and short levers, which we will display later. Uh, the idea of a wedge is, generally speaking, that it's an inclined surface, or it's an object with an inclined surface. So if you just look at my forearm, you'll see that at my hand and my wrist, it's relatively narrow and it gets wider as we get closer to the elbow. So that would be a general wedge shape. So a wedge can be used to separate things, uh, it can be used to move things, or it can be used to lift things up. So if there was something here, as so we look here, as I slide underneath, in a relative sense, I would be able to, as I go up that inclined plane, lift uh, the object, in this case the left arm, from its current position. We can use it to move things and then, again, separate things. Uh, then we have the concept of the screw, uh, which essentially means that you're, use, you're turning, it's something that can turn rotational motion into linear motion. Now we don't necessarily see that in practice within manual therapeutics, and I'll describe this later, but we usually see that at the hip or at the shoulder uh, with respect to rotating the bone. So be it the humerus or the femur to put, so they rotate to put linear force onto uh, the rotator muscles, be it internal or external rotators, or either the shoulder or the hip. We see the general concept of using rotation to place strain on other tissues in many places, and we'll, we'll just talk about that and, and briefly display it as we go forward. But that's the general concept of rotational motion turning into linear motion, or in the case of most technical options, most treatment options, what you're doing is you're using rotational force of something to place stress and strain or pull or tug on other things. Uh, mo in most cases what you're going to do is use a limb to twist or the pelvis to twist or the vertebrae to twist uh, and then create tension on varying soft tissues depending on angulation. But that's the general concept so what we'll do is we'll move from here and we'll start to demonstrate each one of these things. So as we said in the brief introduction to this series of, or to this video series, we're going to display the concepts of lever wedge screw. So first we'll just take a look at what a long lever looks like. So a long lever in most people's practice would usually look like using the arm or the leg to pull on another area. So should I hold at the ankle, at the heel, I can put a lot of tension, and if the knee's straight, I can put some tension through the posterior chain of the leg, through the hamstring, so this could be long lever to affect the hamstring. If I need to go up higher, for whatever reason, through the chain, through the lever, I can take some tension on the posterior chain. So now the whole leg is a lever, 
pulling up towards the hip. Now what happens is I shorten this up and essentially I've taken the leg below the knee out of the lever and now this lever can put some tension closer to the hip through the gluteal region uh, into the low back, into the lumbar column. You'd be more familiar with something for many practitioners that looks like this, right? But the idea is now my, the femur is my lever and then at whatever point the femur runs out of motion uh, at the acetabulum, so at the hip, and then the next thing that's going to get pulled on is the pelvis, the next thing that's going to get pulled on is the lumbar region. So that's a very common way to see the long lever through the leg. Another common long lever is the arm, right? So I can use the arm to work in and around the pectoral region, in and around the deltoid, in and around the scapula. Uh, for some situations I may be able to use the arm as a long lever to work through the neck. So if I were to pull, if you watch the patient's head, if I pull, I can at times use the arm to work through the trape trapezius, to work through the levator scapula, uh, in some cases to just generally pull on the neck. So I can also often, if used appropriately, use utilize the arm to move the thorax in general. It's very difficult to get the arm to pull on the thoracic vertebrae because the scapula is connected to it by muscle, so it will slide a lot. It's very difficult to get the leverage. But those are your common examples of long levers. So now we're just talking about uh, the general concept of short levers. So a short lever is usually when you're directly on a structure. So if I was to look at the patient's wrist, right, I can work, or really more so the carpals. So the carpals tend to be in an arch, right? So you've got a bit of an arch there. You can flatten that arch. So short lever, I'm directly on the structures that I'm interfacing with. Um, I can work directly, or I can work at the radio ulnar region, uh, the distal radio ulnar joint. <clears throat> I can work short lever on the tissues of the forearm. I can work short lever on the tissues of the arm or the brachium. I can work short lever through the shoulder. Right, so I can push directly on the humerus to move it in relation to the scapula or really in relation to the glenoid. Now, if we're talking about glides of the glenohumeral joint, so this doesn't work particularly effectively. Right? So you see that the shoulder's moving or the humerus is moving somewhat in relation to the glenoid, at least from what we can see externally. It's very unlikely that I'm going to be able to do anything effective to the GH joint if I simply use a short lever. So then what we would do is do something called a mixed leverage approach. So a mix between short and long levers. So the long lever approach would simply be to take the arm, to take the arm usually in the region of the forearm. Uh, possibly if somebody has a problem with their bicep for some reason, I can bend the arm and now I can start to do my glides. Right, so I can do a long lever motion of the shoulder, right? I can do a long lever motion by moving here and then I can do short lever. So if my aim is to get the head of the humerus to go posterior with relation to the glenoid, I lift up and it begins, and I can go short lever here. Right? So that's mixed leverage. It's using a long lever and a short lever at the same time. If I was to talk about soft tissues, right? so I look at the bicep, generally speaking, or I look at the tissues on the anterior side of the humerus, now I can short lever, mo mobilize them, and then I can engage the barrier. And so now what I've done is engage the concept of relational motion. So I move the tissues one way, and then I move the bone in relation to the tissues. So that moving the tissues is short lever because I'm right on them. Using the lever of the bones is the long lever portion. So now I've also introduced a mixed lever approach. So now we're gonna take a look at what a wedge looks like. So the idea of the wedge is that it's an inclined plane. Right, so if I simply take a look at my forearm, uh, maybe I'm not getting the right angle. There we go, that's a little better. And I look here, the width here versus the width here. So my forearm could be considered an inclined plane. So sometimes what you'll do is you'll place your hand underneath something and then the, depending on how far you need to move it away from the table or how hard you want to wedge it, you just put the person further up on your forearm. Uh, that is primarily useful when somebody's in supine and you want to place something underneath them, right? So as an example, right? So there we go. I've got my hand, which is relatively narrow compared 
to the for compared to the proximal end of my forearm. So I've got that. So we just look at my ability to lift the patient's the patient off of the table. Push your arm over that way. Come back. So we'll just come back. There you go. And now, in a relative sense, I get more wedging effect. I can move the patient farther because I've inserted a thicker portion of my forearm, my hand, in this case my hypothenar region and my thenar region are underneath the patient's ribs, medial to scapula. Right? So that's one way to look at a wedge. Right? <clears throat> Another place to use a wedge is when you're trying to separate surfaces. Right? So I mean, in a technical sense, I'm trying to separate the posterior surface of the patient from the table. So I put the wedge on the table and separate him from that. Another place to do that could be at larger joints, right? So we look at the elbow, we could do the same thing at the knee, but we'll look at the elbow here. So if I'm looking at these two surfaces, and for whatever reason I want them to separate, if I simply put my hand in here on that anterior surface, as I close, right, as I close that in a relative sense, what I get is a separation of these two surfaces as they fold over my hand. Here they approximate, right, so here they approximate, here, in a relative sense, because of the strain of the wedge, they get farther apart. We can look at that in the axilla. Now, this isn't perfect. This isn't absolutely the way I would always do it. However, because of the angle of the camera, right? So now what I can do as my hand is in here, as I bring the humerus towards the body, what I can do is with the humeral head, this wedge will start to pull it away, right? So as I come here, because I've inserted my hand in the axilla, the head of the humerus actually comes away from the glenoid, whereas here it just kind of comes towards it. But I put the wedge in and it separates. Another common area to use wedging is in intercostal spaces. So some people will use a thumb bar, right? Some people will use the index finger. You get into the intercostal space, you hold the inferior rib down, and then as they breathe, there's a wedge because you're able as the ribs separate mildly, you're able to get deeper and deeper, so you get a separation. Another way to do that is to use your hands here, right? So this is not necessarily a straight line, but if I curl my fingers, then I can get essentially a straight line. I can go into the intercostal space there and wedge as well, or you can do kind of point wedging uh, with a finger pad. The intercostal region tends to be quite sensitive, so you want to be careful about it, but if I go in between those spaces and then as movement occurs through respiration, I go deeper and deeper. As the movement happens and I start to deform, in a relative sense, the intercostal musculature, I will get some separation of surfaces. So now we're just going to demonstrate what the concept of the screw looks like, or taking a rotational force and turning it into a linear force. Now with respect to the body, the way that it works, the two places where you're most likely to get essentially the transference or the, the change of a rotational force into linear force is at the hips and at the shoulders. So as I internally rotate the whole leg, what's going to happen is as I do that, as I internally rotate the thigh, I'm going to start to take a rotational force against the external rotators and that's where you'll get the, the conversion to a linear force, right? So the rotators, if we say the rotator cuff and the shoulder, very relatively, the tendons in the fascicle direction tend to be from the midline out towards the shoulder. As in the case of the hip rotators, very, very generally the tendons, although they have angle to them, run from the midline out to the periphery. So as we create torque in the limb, what we can do is take that rotational force and turn into linear force against those soft tissues, whether it be the internal or external rotators. Another way that that looks, that you will have seen that, and I've done this many times, right, is the actual rotation of the femur in the acetabulum, obviously in a flexed position. So this is changes some of the angulation against those tissues, but we get that rotation of the femur against the pelvis, which is the rotational force turning into a linear force against <clears throat> the hip rotators, depending on the direction, either the internal or external rotators. The same would be said here. Okay, so a rotational force of the humerus turning into a linear force against the soft tissues. Now very generally speaking, the concept of the screw or the turn 
uh, will be applied in many other places, but it isn't necessarily true to the strict definition. However, in spirit, it's very accurate or at least very useful. So if I take the patient's leg, right, I draw this across, I'm getting a rotational force. So now it's not a rotational force at the hip so much as it is a rotational force once the hip runs out of space to move or I get some, some kind of joint lock or a lack of joint play, then what will happen is the pelvis will start to rotate. So I get a rotational force from the pelvis going up through the vertebral columns so on a relative sense. Although this is nowhere near as far as the vertebral column can rotate, I get that rotational force going vertical. Now depending on the tendon that we're talking about, the specific ligament or specific soft tissue or muscle, what we may get is a linear force, so the rotation of the vertebrae, in a relative sense, may begin to apply a linear force against some of those soft tissues, but not exclusively because they're all at different angles, and in each individual, even at different vertebral segments, they'll be at different angles. But the relative concept that the rotation, the rotatory motion, will apply strain to soft tissues is here, and I can do that with the arms as well, but the basic concept is that the term screw, in, as spoken by Dr. Still, was the concept of just creating rotation in one space to create tension uh, or motion against another. So the idea of the leverage. 